good morning. This is Pastor Jeff Fairley with Faith and Grace Fellowship. Starting this just a minute or two early so that people can see it come on their feed. We are a church plant in the South Kansas City, specifically Grandview, Missouri area. We're in the Comfort Suites in Grandview which is right off of the west side of 71 and 49, just south of Truman Marketplace, right at the corner of Harry Truman and uh, the what's called the West Outer Road. So it faces, the hotel faces the highway. If you're going down the highway, down 71, and you see on the west side, you see the Comfort Suites, we're there in the boardroom. If you're in the Kansas City metro area, 10.30 on Sunday mornings, we're right here. We'd love to have you. We have a number of people that join online. I think yesterday I was looking back and there was like 50 some people that saw last week's message. By the time the message was over, there was a 14 to 19 views. I forget how many, but God blesses in that this message goes farther than just who are physically here. We reach a lot of people outside this place. I'd also like to say that on our, um, I'm, I'm starting up a YouTube channel. I've gotten uh, some stuff set up. I've still got more work to do. I've got a couple of uh, uh, Sunday morning videos put up there. There's a lot of content I want to put up there from the past. It's going to take time, but hopefully I can get into a cadence that I finish service here and we get that uploaded so that eventually you can go there and watch easier to find by looking at what's uh, what's there versus trying to find it on the Facebook feed so God bless our opening scripture comes from Matthew chapter 14 and I have 14 to 16 here but the only verse I have is 14 you are the light of the world a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. You know, in, in military and in law enforcement, they talk to us about how far light goes perceptibly by the eye. And when you're on a situation where it's nighttime and you need to be uh, darkened out because of your safety, because of what's going on or, or what you're trying to uh, uh, stay happening, because it says I've got no power. I've got another one, another battery pack. We'll see here in a second. Anyway, um, with light, a pinpoint of light can be seen in a lot of places. They say that a cigarette butt, the smoking of a cigarette, can be seen over a mile away. When you're living for Christ, the light of Christ is in you. It will shine out. People will see it. They will notice it. You don't have to put sandwich board sign on that says I'm a Christian I'm a Christian follow me and yeah, let's go to heaven together you, you don't have to put the sandwich board sign on people will know there's something different I've heard people say there's something different about you what is it you go through the same things I do every week every day yet you handle it differently that's part of the light As we go to the Lord in prayer, we always pray for the peace of Jerusalem, Psalm 122, 6. We also pray for the workers for the harvest, sun-minded people, people that want to be parents to new believers, to raise them up, to lift them up, and to uh, edify them, to help them to grow and, and learn how to pray, how to walk, how to read the word, how to study, what it means to be a Christian in practical daily living. And the church has, has really fallen short on that. They like to say, oh, you're new to the church. We're going to plug you into this program. You get to sit over here in this discipleship class until you get to the point that you can come in and behave in here and understand what we're doing here. God doesn't say, go make programs. Go make all kinds of places for people to be. He says, go make disciples. 
and he's talking to individuals to be the disciple makers. Uh, once we have a child on the way, we become parents. And when we become parents, we just are. Some are good parents, some are bad parents. But a parenting aspect is to teach the child everything they need. Hey, they're learning how to walk. They're learning their ABCs. They're learning their numbers. They're learning to put sentences together instead of just babble. In those ways, they are taught, they are trained. And why should being a new Christian uh, teaching be any different? We need to teach those who are uh, brand new Christians. We need to teach them how to walk with the Lord, what it takes to be a believer. So that's what we're praying for. We're also praying against the spirit of wickedness in this spirit in this uh, metro area. We already have the victory over it. The word tells us we do, but it tells us to take authority to bind and to loose. So we're binding those things that the enemy is trying to do of wickedness, and we do it in the places that we have standing, where we have citizenship, where we have places of business, where we live. So in our city, state, counties, uh, federal region, in our nation, and we elect our government officials in, in the government. So we're praying against those and binding those things, but we're also loosing the Holy Spirit into those same areas that God move and the people get uh, hungry for the things of God. The people of the church become the church and start living accordingly so that People get hungry. They see the light. They say, there's something about you that I want. Nobody goes shopping and, and says, man, all this stuff is junk. It's broken down. It's, it's worse than the stuff I got at home. Load it up, boys. We're going we're gonna to buy it all. They go and see something new or shiny, something they don't have, or a new, uh, whatchamacallit, that has a new thingamajig and it, it does things differently and it catches your eye and says, I want that. Well, people need to see this, this something different in each of us so that they want that and then we can share, well, it's Jesus. Jesus did this for me. I also pray for those that are looking for jobs. I know people right now that have active needs of looking for jobs that will suffice and support. Uh, there's others that were praying about that have uh, fixed income and the extra outgo for utilities and gasoline and food, among other things, is draining what was already a tight budget. So we're praying for God to continue to stretch all of that to do a miracle in each of these lives. A number of people we're praying for is Rita Hoffman, her leg, continuing to pray for that, for Kathy, for Keith Wilson's family, for Lisa Hunsell, Aunt Darlene, and Aunt Jane as they continue to recover. For Donald Miller, um, he's got some uh, more medical problems. And they, they say that when you're born starting off uh, with the, the heart condition and the medical condition and as uh, weak as he was, that there's a number of things that he will probably face throughout his life, including having a feeding tube and things. So we're gonna see God work in this little boy's life. Uh, pray for my mom. God continue to heal her. She's getting great uh, uh, reviews from the PT and OT. And I saw mom, you're watching. Got a couple special unspoken requests, one for 2022 and another special unspoken request that we've been praying for. For Rob and Robin Ballinger, that God continue to heal and, and help them with all that they're going through and, and all that they're they're dealing with. I thank God that He is on the throne and He is the He is the Deliverer. Amen. For Steve Rippy, my cousin, for my brother Mark, for Sam Crabtree, and there's been other requests that people are providing that aren't listed here that we also will be praying for because they're according to the Word of God. If you have a need and it's according to the will of God, you also call out on that and I add my agreement to your prayers right now that God meet those needs according to his word, his will. Father, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. According to 122.6, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. 
not just for the city and the government in that city, for that nation, but the nation, all the people called by the name of Abraham, wherever they may be in the world, that peace be in their lives and their homes, that the enemy and the anti-Semitism that is cropping up in this world, the anti-Zionism would not prevail, that Father, it would be found to be false and debunked, and even the injurious things that the enemy is trying to do through people that have got swayed thoughts and ideas and ideologies. I pray that those be found out before there's any harm to anyone, no matter where these people reside in the world. Lord, watch over your people, each and every one of them. You know the hairs of their head, and they're numbered. You, you watch over every one of them. We ask for peace in their lives and their homes. Pray for workers for the harvest, people that are grown up, ready to stand up and take their place, parenting other new believers. Father, as, as the revivals are happening around the nation, people need to step up and start teaching and leading and guiding these people in truth so that they know how to walk and how to live. And I thank you, Lord, that you're raising this army up. I bind the spiritual wickedness in this city, in this county, in this state, in this federal region, in our nation, in our nation's government that the enemy be bound from trying to take over and do things that are against the word of God and things that are against the church. And Father, I loose the Holy Spirit into hearts and lives and homes, living rooms, kitchens, dining rooms, wherever people are watching any of the messages, that people would open up and start getting charged and changed by the word of God and the spirit of God, that people that don't know you would get hungry and people that do know you would get on fire. The people that know you would clean up their act and start letting their light shine. As the old coal oil, coal oil lamps, they've cleaned the globe and let the light shine. They've trimmed the wick and it's bright. Father, I pray for life changing cleansing in the body of Christ so that people see the light of God and are changed by it. We pray for those that are needing jobs or needing expanded income or decrease in their outgo that you move and bless according to your will and your way, Father. And all of these that we've asked for prayer for by name, I ask you to heal where healing is needed, provision where provision is needed, and special and spoken requests, you know the need. I pray that you enter in and meet this need. And Father, I pray for all those requests that people have on their heart that are according to the word of God. I add my agreement to their needs as they call them out now. Father, two or more agree as touching in one thing, it shall be done. And we thank you. The answer is already on its way, according to your word. We pray for the rest of this service, this message, those who are listening, those who are watching, they'd be blessed today in Jesus' name. When Now that it comes time for offering, I know some preachers will preach a long time on offering. I'm not one to think that if somebody wants to buy something, the, the, the clerk behind the counter has to come around and pull their wallet out and say, look, you've got money here, put it in the, in the till. I believe that a cheerful heart, someone that says, I want to give to God, will do that in a giving manner, not because they're coerced to do it. Our offering scripture says, you, uh, 2 Corinthians 9:11. You'll be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Because of the giving over the last couple of years, at least especially in the last year, we have been able to help a number of families with needs that they have because of the giving, because people have given. We've been able to help families with their hurts and their needs to get them over the hump in various uh, times. And it's that generosity that is of giving that those people were thanking God and thanked us. And we had to say, it's, it's God. It's coming from the church. It's people that have given so that we can do this. So thank him. And that's what this is meaning, that the generosity of people are poured into a place that is pouring out so that people can get uh, the help they need. If you decide that you want to give, we're not asking any uh, non-members to give, but if you decide you want to give, 
you can go to our website, fgfellowship.org, FG Fellowship, Faith and Grace Fellowship, fgfellowship.org, and you can go to the giving tab, and you can then find how to give. You can give. It takes you to Tithely. The, the giving comes to us, but the information about your card or your bank account stays with them. So we don't get that information. We don't want to be a merchant. We don't want to have to um, keep all that and all the audits that are required. They do that and they keep that all safe. As we pray over the offering for today, I want to pray over the gift and the giver and thank God for all that have given. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for all the gifts that have come in. I thank you for all of the the givers that have given. I thank you that all of our bills are met, all of our needs are met, Father. And I ask you, Lord, to bless the giver and bless the gift so that we as a church can do all that is our, you've already purposed in your heart for these things to do in Jesus' name. And we give you the glory, the honor, and praise. Amen. Amen. Not quite sure what the weather's going to do outside today, but I know that the glory of God shines bright in here today. It's been a great day so far in worship, and I'm looking forward to delivering this message. But first, let's make our confession. We lift the word and we say, I confess and I declare that this is the word of God. God cannot lie. His word is truth. We accept it. We believe it. We receive it. We live according to grace by faith. The blood of Christ has redeemed us and set us free from sin, sickness, bondage, and separation from God. We are free because of Christ's substitute work on the cross. Amen. This morning's message is titled, The Fruit of the Spirit. Now, if you've gone to church any time in your life at all, at some point you have heard a preacher talk about the fruit of the Spirit, whether it was in the full message or a portion of the message or you found it on a card or, or something, a greeting card or a poster or a wall plaque. But the fruit of the Spirit, I want to de delve a little deeper this morning. So let's go to Galatians chapter 5. This is out of the New King James. I'm going to read verses 22 through 25. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us pray. Father, I pray for your anointing on me and my lips. I thank you, Lord, for this message, and I pray for the ears of those that hear and those that are listening to, to hear the message and let it go deep with them, that they see and their eyes be opened, their hearts be open to receive, and they take this and mix it with their faith, and it becomes profitable personally for them in Jesus' name. Fruit can be something on a tree or a vine. It can be something uh, like that. But fruit is that which originates or comes from something, an effect or a result. If you work 40 hours a day, you expect your paycheck to reflect that. Your paycheck that you receive and the money you receive is the fruit of your labor. Your children are the fruit of your marriage. They become good fruit or bad fruit, depending on how you raise them. And we're going to go through the fruit here for a second because we need to get an understanding of what the Greek word and meanings of these fruit are. Most of them we understand totally, but I want to, I want to get a little more definition before we go too much deeper. The Greek word used for love in this passage is agape. Agape is the Greek word of the continual giving love, receiving nothing back. Think of a mother that, brand new mother, she has the baby and she's up at night feeding and changing and taking care of maybe two, three, four times a night, depending on the child, all through the day, 
constant care throughout the hours, husbands that go, will get up and, and take that night shift to let her continue to sleep at times, even though he has to go to work, take care of that child as much as possible because they're a team. And that giving, you're not sitting down and saying, okay, I put in six hours, you put in 22. I put in five hours, you put in 24. So you owe me for those hours I put in. So somehow down the road, you're gonna pay me back. It's, it's, a, it's a love, that, that doesn't happen. It's a love that gives expecting nothing back in return. A good marriage is that way. There's not a, I gave 50% and you're not giving your 50, you're only giving 30, so there's a problem. If the one gives 100 and the other gives 100, it's a beautiful marriage. And then when one is sick and can't carry on, whether illness, disease, temporary, or an injury, can't carry on for a while, the one that has been giving 100 is now carrying until that one's back on their feet. And that's the, the message of being propped up and, and held up. And that love is all encompassing. It's also the love that doesn't think any wrong. It doesn't look at someone and say, oh, I know what you're gonna say. You said it before. Love is looking at that person and saying, I love you. And I don't think any ill will of you. Joy is the word kara in Greek, and it means just that, joy, happiness. Peace, in Hebrew, we would think shalom. And uh, in Greek, and I, I don't know that I pronounced this right, but it's irene, I, irene, it's e-i-r, e E with a uh, umlaut, an N, and another E with umlaut. But it's a state of tranquility. It's a joining together what has been separated or broken. Uh, if you got in a situation where you fell or someone fell on you or something hit you and it broke your arm, you would be in pain, it would be broken, it would be hurting. You get to the doctor and they get it realigned and then they put a cast on it. While the cast is on there, you, you take some medicine for uh, swelling and for pain. That cast, that splint, holds it in place while it's mending. The doctors don't go in there and do some magical thing at the ends of the bone and make them get back together unless they're totally shattered and they have to wire them together. But still then they grow back together. The, the body does that. But peace is that in the midst of a broken situation, it can be held together in such a way that whatever was broken, that as it's mending, you have a tranquility about it. When your arm's casted, it's still broken, but you're able to be at peace while it mends. Long suffering. I won't try to pronounce that because the Greek word is as long as long suffering. It basically means patience, forbearance, long suffering, slowness in avenging wrongs. We see people that do the typical tit for tat. You did this, I'm gonna do that to you. Eye for an eye, immediately. The long suffering is sitting back and saying, you know, I know that you did wrong. I know you, you did me wrong. I'm not gonna hold this against you. You'll trap yourself. You don't need me to chase after you and rope you down. And so long suffering is, is actually sitting back and going back to peace, being at peace with what and who you are without having to let them run your life. Goodness, I mean, it's a kindness. Uh, this word kindness actually means kindness and gentleness. 
you think of a uh, a kind act. Someone uh, steps up and says, "Oh, you don't have enough money to pay your for your groceries. Put these things on my bill." That's a kind and a, a act and a gentleness act. Kindness is not beating someone over the head. You're going to take this money whether you like it or not. I'm trying to be kind to you. Kindness has a gentleness to it. It's, it's a smoothness. Faith is the, the Greek word pistis. It's a conviction of the truth of anything. When you know what that is, you, can, you have that conviction that if I go speeding uh, down the highway, 80 miles an hour in a 65, and the cops are out, He's probably going to turn his lights on and stop me. I'll get a ticket. I'm not going to do that because I have faith that that's what they're out there to do. They're out there to make sure that people aren't hurting themselves and going faster than they're supposed to. And so that's a conviction I have. It can also be a belief respecting man's relationship to God. Our faith is a tangible thing. It's not just a ethereal thought. Uh, Gentleness is also another one of the fruit of the Spirit. And that Greek word is a different Greek word, which means gentleness, mindness, or meekness, mildness or meekness. And so it actually talks about the, the still pond, the, the, the pond without any ripples. I remember as Boy Scouts, we'd get up uh, on a camp trip, float trip, and sometimes we went to a lake and we'd get up and be fixing breakfast and the canoes are there and people are still waking up and breakfast is cooking and you look out over the, the lake and it's just still and the cranes flying just over the, the top looking for fish and the, the, the steam is slowly rising from the uh, from the lake and the sun just creeps over and starts painting hues and pictures of the uh, on the waters and it's just so still you hear the birds chirping and that's a picture of gentleness and meekness in that everything's at right with the world it's just calm it's gentle you don't want to break that scenario and then temperance in the King James is used as uh, the last word for self-control it it means basically that self-control the virtue of one who masters his desires and passions especially his sensual appetites uh, a child that you can't take to the grocery store and mom I apologize you used to have that problem with us boys can't take to the grocery store because something was bound to happen I remember we were in a store in Gladstone I believe it was we we're walking along uh, I think it's when we lived up on North Main. We're walking through the store, and I'm a few steps behind you. My brother's just right there, too, and Mark's in the cart. Robin must have been riding on the front of the cart. But we're going along, and I heard a, a jar fall to the ground back behind us. You turned and looked at myself and my brother, and I said, Mom, we weren't even there. We didn't touch it. Okay? We had to use self-control that time, but prior times it would have been us going along and touching something and know it fell. We didn't have a lot of self-control. We were boys. But self-control can also be when something doesn't respond, require the response that you have and you go off the handle. Or in a lot of times, sexual, sensual appetites People run with them when they shouldn't. They've got, this is where their their appetite should be, and yet they're looking at another table. They're looking at another situation they shouldn't be, or they're, they're partaking there. And so self-control has to do with being able to stay in control of your mind, your will, your intellect, and your body. Your mind, your will, and your intellect is your soul, and your body is the physical body. So self-control is keeping that under in check the way it's supposed to be.
According to the Word of God, we receive the fruit of the Spirit as salvation. Peter tells us that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. The third person of the Trinity comes in and we are reborn. Uh, we are a spirit, a soul, and a body. When Adam and Eve fell, their spirit went from being a life spirit, the way God breathed into man, he said they made him a living spirit. He, man became a dead spirit with still a soul and a body. All of us have had a dead spirit until we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and then we receive that new spirit. We'll talk more about that here in a little bit. But we're told that we receive this fruit of the spirit when the spirit makes us new. And so as believers, our flesh, our physical flesh, our desires for, for taking care of this body, fight against the spiritual fruit. Have you ever noticed the things that you struggled with since accepting Christ? I remember as a young Christian, I accepted Christ and I had trouble with cigarettes. I had smoked cigarettes before I got saved. I was still smoking cigarettes after I got saved. God didn't plug up this chimney all of a sudden while I was saved because I was still puffing them. I found the best way to quit. The best way to quit, the easiest way to quit for me was when I stopped buying them. Didn't buy them, I didn't have them. There, while I was still fighting some of the addiction and still praying about it and still having the nicotine, people got upset that I was borrowing or bumming cigarettes because I was never gonna buy any to pay them back. So uh, it, it was self-limiting. But um, I had to take self-control of what my habit had been. But we have that spirit within us when we get saved. So basically love unconditionally. Peace, the ability to wait it out as things are being restored. Kindness, being able to hold on when things get tough. Self-control, maybe they're believers. You just can't give up alcohol, drugs, lust, food. Food's also a drug. It used to make, it's, if it's used to make you feel better. These things that you fight destroys the harvest of the fruit in your life. Galatians 5.24 says, And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Crucifixion is a horrible, horrible death. It hasn't been around forever. The Persians, who are now the Iranians, came up with this cruel way of killing someone by staking them out on a tree. And they found that by putting a crossbar and putting their arms out like this and then crunching their legs up so that they're the person's hanging, crunching their legs up and then putting a nail there. The person, as they're hanging like this, the muscles of the chest, which you need for breathing, actually start to paralyze as the arms go weak, as the arms go tired. And you can't get a breath unless you push up on that other nail on your feet, push up to get yourself enough of a breath to last a little longer. Some people lasted days on the cross. The problem is the way they would put your feet and bend your knees up to the side, your legs would go into a cramp. I don't know if you've ever uh, experienced a cramp where you just can't straighten your leg out or you need to straighten it out to get that muscle to relax. You can't because you're nailed there. And so when they would push up, it was excruciating pain in the legs and it wasn't a smooth cross, a smooth board, it was rough. And so their back would get caught on slivers and spinners on this rough wood. And they had to pull up with all that they could and it took energy to get that breath. And so they were constantly shimmying up and down on this, uh, on this cross to get air. The 
Romans took over this and they made it even worse. They took what the, the Iranians had done and they made it as bad as I just mentioned. They took it and, and used it as a psychological weapon. There were times that people, they, they had crosses lined on either side of the road and people had to walk past them. And these weren't crosses, or these people weren't on there in their clothes. They took their clothes off of them. It was a shame to have these people there. Flavius Josephus, who was a, a, a Jewish general that they had been defeated by the Romans, but instead of killing him, he was a great historian, and so he was allowed to uh, continue to be a historian and even uh, go with the Roman armies at times. He came across a deal as they were going through and saw three of his friends, acquaintances, on the cross for something. Somebody had uh, said something or done something and they were put on these crosses. And he was horrified and he went to the commander and was able to procure their release from the crosses. And so got the three of them down and sent them to uh, be taken care of by the doctors. And even though they were taken down off of the cross because of the effects of it, two of them still died even under medical care. And so crucifixion was a long horrifying, shameful, painful activity. When I looked up the word crucify in the, uh, in the biblical dictionary, it comes up with to stake or drive down stakes, to fortify with driven stakes, a palisade. You think of uh, pile driving when they're going to put up a building and there's not a good foundation. They will drive piles or if they're along the highway, they want to uh, take some of the um, dirt away because they're going to widen the road. They will drive piles down to keep everything stable while they they uh, do this work. But a palisade, remember the old Daniel Boone style forts where they had the the, uh, the trees, the, the Fort Apache, the Fort Boone, the, all these different, the, the one right after another together. They would drive those down in the ground. They didn't just uh, stand them up at boards. They went down into the ground to make a solid fort. So this uh, palisade. And to crucify also means to crucify the flesh, to destroy its power utterly, the nature of the figure of implying that the destruction is attended with intense pain. I remember the last time that I smoked, I had prayed and prayed and prayed that I would not smoke ever again. And if I did and picked them up again, I asked God to make me sick. And I did. And he did. And I was like 20 years old. I've lived more life without cigarettes than I ever did with them. And it seems like a total different life somebody else's story because it's so foreign to me talking about crucifixion the psalmist wrote a uh, prophetically what Christ would experience and even say while he was on the cross well, we find this in Psalm chapter 22 I'm going to read a portion of it not the whole psalm the whole chapter but we see this and knowing what we've heard about when Christ was on the cross, you'll get an idea of how painful this was. It's a horrible way to die. Doctors have reviewed this passage and some in Isaiah and have concluded that the person describing how they're feeling and their symptoms is the, is the exact same uh, symptoms and feelings that a person would have if they were being crucified. And when this psalm was written, crucifixion wasn't even uh, a uh, it wasn't even a type of death yet. It had never been not been invented by the Persians. So this was prophetically written. And I just want you to yeah, what happened there. I just want you to follow with me. This is Psalm 22 verses 1 through 25 is called the suffering praise and posterity of the Messiah 
to the chief musician set to the deer of the dawn. So there was a song back then called the deer of the dawn. And so this is a psalm that they would sing to that. It was a psalm written by David. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from my, my, the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. You ever felt that way? Anguish, depression. This is the, what Jesus was feeling on the cross, prophetically spoken. And in the night season, and I'm not silent, and you are, but you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. But I am a worm. I am no man, a reproach of men, despised by the people. Remember going back to the way they had to slither up and down the cross? It's almost like an inchworm or a worm moving across the ground or a caterpillar. He said, I am but a worm and no man. Remember, this had not been this this way of crucifying or killing someone had not been invented when this was written. All who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip and they shake their head saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. The people walking past the cross said that about Jesus on the cross. Prophetically and the application of it. But you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while on my mother's breast. I was cast up Upon you from birth from my mother's womb you have been my God be not far from me for trouble is near for there is none to help many bulls have surrounded me strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me they gape at me with their mouths like raging and roaring lions here's the symptoms I'm poured out like water all my bones are out of joint my heart is like wax it is melted within me my strength is dried up like a potsherd my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. Remember when Jesus was on the cross, he said, I thirst. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Again, crucifixion was not um, invented when this was written. They look and stare. At, I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sound familiar? You read that in the Gospels. What the Roman soldiers did fulfilled this prophetic scripture. But you, O Lord, do not be far from me. O my strength, hasten to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, from the horns of the wild oxen. You have answered me. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All the descendants of Jacob, glorify him and fear him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him, he heard, my praise shall be of you in the great assembly. I will pay my vows for those who fear him. When Jesus called out on the cross, into your hands I commit my spirit. This is where he was calling out to God. All this was prophetically written by David and sung over all these many uh, ages and yet fulfilled by Christ. Crucifixion is a definite, painful, operation and we when you take your flesh the desires of your body and you crucify them you say this is it it's over it's done it's buried it's not coming back you say what are the the, the things of the flesh if your body is saying you need to drink until you're drunk if your body is saying you need drugs or you need sex or you need food or you need this you need that you got to do this you got to do that you got to have all these special clothes and stuff you're you're feeding the body 
But if you're spending time in the Word with the Lord, you're talking to the Lord, you're, you're getting nourishment from Him, you will direct your soul towards those types of things instead of towards the things the body's after. Now, there's nothing wrong with NASCAR. There's nothing wrong with football. There's nothing wrong with baseball. There's nothing wrong with those things that I mentioned because in moderation, unless it's unless it's a, a, a sin like adultery or, or, or sex outside of marriage or something like that or, or stealing or something that's going to really hurt you, over drinking, overeating, drugs, etc., etc., those kind of things, there's a, there's a logical reason that you shouldn't be doing them. But for the most part, if your body is leading, your soul will follow and your spirit is drug along like on the ground. But if you're feeding your spirit, your soul will follow the spirit and your body becomes the caboose and it stops being in charge. But you can tell when you're following the lust of the flesh or you're following the flesh when it's feeding the desires. There's nothing wrong with a good barbecue. There's nothing wrong with a good Thanksgiving dinner or going to someplace all you can eat buffet. The difference is, can you do that in moderation? Can you do it with self-control? See, all these fruit of the Spirit you were given when you accepted Christ. All these fruit of the Spirit are things that are already in you. And when you feed the Spirit, you start feeding love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, meekness, self-control. You already have it. It's already been given to you, just like salvation. It's there, you just don't recognize it's there. So when you have a need of, of something, you're looking at, at uh, oh, I, I, I'm gonna go do this. I've, I've always had a problem with going to the buffet and, and eating the thing till I can't stop. Wait a second, Father, I, I need to exercise some of my self-control, the fruit of the Spirit. I'm gonna go and take the plate that I need for now and I'll eat it. I want a little more, I'll go back and get a little more, but I'm not coming back with seven plates. And that self-control in that area will lead into the self-control in other areas. See, you, I'm, I'm reminded of a, um, I believe it was an Alaskan uh, uh, native. He would come to town and bring two of his sled dogs with him. And when he brought these dogs, the villagers would wage on which dog was going to win in the fight. And he'd wait till they'd all waged, and then he would wage on one of the dogs. They would fight, that dog would win. And each time he brought the same two dogs, and each time one or other dog won. And the villagers said, how is it that you always know which dog's going to win? And he said, that's easy, it's the one I feed that day. So the fruit of the Spirit is, is something that's an outgrow of your salvation, but are you feeding the Spirit so that the things of the fruit of the Spirit will grow deeper in you? You can go out there and, and look at a field that had last year's corn in it and it didn't plant anything this year, and there's, there's volunteer corn. But they didn't put all the nutrients in the field. They didn't prepare the field right. This is stuff left over when they pulled the harvest out some of the cobs and kernels and stuff fell and it's just there is it good corn it may not be a bumper crop of of uh, kernels but there'll be corn on there the problem is if we're not preparing the field in our lives and saying god i want this stuff out of me i'm going to crucify this flesh i'm going to i'm going to dig up this field so that there's nothing there and it's prepared for the crop that you want to plant and the fruit you want in my life you're going to have volunteer stuff come up from last year and the year before. The sins that caused you such a, a, a big deal is going to show up, and you're going to have to deal with that. I've dealt with some people, some ministers, that they got their eyes off the Lord and they started feeding the wrong things. The Word talks about restoration, to restore and if the person is repentant and they're willing to go through the process, there is a restoration. And I've seen people get restored. I've seen others back in the day, they didn't want anything. When they took off, they left God and took off. 
they wanted validation that they were still okay, I wouldn't give it to them. See, validation comes from God, not from man. And God says that you're forgiven. So have you destroyed the fruit in your life, the fruit of the Spirit? Are you plowing it under when God's saying, don't plow it under, harvest it? Eat of the fruit. It's there for your well-being. Feeding your spirit the things that God's already put in there to fulfill you. When troubles come, do you have peace? Do you have that sense of, of peace and tranquility while things are broken, but they've been mended and they're, and they're being healed like a broken bone in a, in a cast? Do you have that sense that, that God's still in control? Some of our worlds have been turned upside down from things that have happened. Some people lost their jobs during COVID. Others lost their families. Some people have, have lost family members to death during this, and they're having troubles. God says that he brought you peace. Just like he gave you a measure of faith when you got saved, he gave you this fruit of the Spirit. It was the bonus, the add-on, something to feed your spirit to grow on. Eat of it. Don't plow it under. You need to destroy the fruit of your past life. The things that were sins that so easily beset you, God wants to set you free from them completely. And like me, back when I used to smoke cigarettes as a young man, the easiest way for me to quit was when I stopped buying them. I didn't have them around. Now, I did a lot of praying. It took me four years to quit. I did a lot of praying. But when I realized that, you know, if I stopped buying them, they weren't here. And when they weren't here, I wasn't picking them up. And so I found my way. It may work for you too. If there's something that you're doing or something you're in activities and it's not according to the fruit of the Spirit and it is a, uh, a addiction or a hindrance and it's something that's going to tear you down and destroy your body and you can stop buying it, stop buying it. I do want to say God forgives. God's in the forgiving business. God's forgiveness is not just from now on. He forgives both ends of the timeline. When he forgives, he forgives everything prior to the event that happened and everything that would have come from it going forward. He restores. He takes your sin and passes it as far as the east is from the west. You can travel on a plane if you could go around the globe and you would travel east and travel east and travel east until you get back to your point of destination. You can still go east. You will never end up at west. But if you fly to the North Pole, you will get to the North Pole and as soon as you cross it, all of a sudden you're heading south. God didn't say I'll pass it as far as the north to the south because there are finite points that he they would say, okay, he's only going to take it so far. But he took takes it from the east to the west. He takes it far away. You'll never find it. It's gone. I heard one preacher say he casts it in the sea of forgetfulness and he puts up a no fishing sign. God forgives and God restores. It's his job to do that. But if you let the fruit that he gave you die on the branches, even if you have, God forgives and God restores. Galatians 2.20 in the New King James says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I remember singing this song in VBS and in Sunday school and growing up in church. I can still sing it. As I read it, I hear the song in my head. I won't bore you with that. But I've been crucified with Christ. We can sing that song and say that, but are we putting the real meaning in what it meant to be crucified with Christ? That was a painful death. There was no getting back from that. Once you were crucified, the only thing after that was the toe tag and in the grave. You were gone. All hope was lost. 
There was no coming back. And if we take our flesh and we put it on the cross with Christ and we say, I'm not going back to the flesh. It's not going to rule and reign over me. I'm going to feed the spirit and I'm going to start feasting on the fruit of the spirit that God gave me to give me the peace, the love, the joy, the kindness, the gentleness, the meekness, the long suffering, the self-control, the goodness. All those things are already in you as a believer. And if you'll look at, before I go farther with the Galatians 2.20, if you'll look at the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is love. All of the other fruit of the Spirit modifies love. Because if you don't have that love that is continually giving, you won't have peace. You won't have kindness meekness, self-control. You won't have a reason for self-control. You won't have a reason for long-suffering. And so each of them modify the first of the fruit, which is love. And God gives you that in abundance. So going back to the, to the crucifixion, the Galatians 2.20, I want to read this in the, the Passion Translation because it takes and just gives us a little more um, in our vernacular. My old identity has been co-crucified with Christ and no longer lives. When you lay down your life and you pick up the free gift of Christ to become a new creation, your old identity is gone. He takes it away. He takes your filthy rags and he replaces it with his robe of righteousness. You're no longer the person you used to be, a sinner and unsaved. You become a child of the Most High God. He gives you a new identity. So your old identity has been co-crucified with Christ and no longer lives. It's dead. That's a factual statement. And you think about crucifixion. Once you were crucified, there was no coming back. It's a miracle that Jesus rose from the dead after crucifixion because there was no reviving from that. And now the essence of this new life is no longer mine. Not only is the flesh been crucified but even the essence of this life is no longer mine it's his I've been bought with a price he has paid and redeemed me from death and sin into newness of life if he paid for me he's my Lord if he bought me I'm his I'm his purchased possession the essence of this new life is no longer mine For the anointed one, the Christ, the anointed one, lives his life through me. Have you ever thought, is Christ living his life through you? Are the things you're doing things that he would do when he, if he was here? I, I mentioned this to one minister that was having some problems one day, and I said, you know what? There is scripture, and I shared with him the verse, and I won't go there right now. But I also shared this one with him. I said, when you go out into sin and you go do these things that you're telling me you're doing and you're repenting or you're remorseful, one of the two, that when you go do those, you've got Jesus by the robe and you're dragging him out into that sin with you. Because the anointed one lives his life through me. When you start thinking, who are you involving in your sin or in your in your anger, in your the things that aren't pleasing. Come here, Jesus. I want I want you to see this when I go clock this person. Come on, Jesus. We're going to go get drunk. Does that make sense? It doesn't. And when you start thinking that you're not your own anymore, but you're taking him into your sin with you, you might stop. He goes on. We live in union as one. My new life is empowered by the faith of the Son of God who loves me so much that he gave himself for me. In other words, Paul here is talking about how that my old life is dead, my old essence is dead, and now I live in Christ and he lives in and through me and we together are walking this life and I am empowered by the faith of the Son of God, by his faith in me because he loves me. People will follow people because they love them. 
he loves me so much that he gave himself for me, that he died for me, dispensing his life into mine. See, when that, when Peter says that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit, that's the third person of the Trinity living inside you. When you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity baptizes you and fills you even more. But just at salvation, Christ lives in you. You crucify the old flesh, you accept the new life, you get this fruit, fruit of the Spirit, you have a feasting and a fellowship that you've never had before because you have it with Him in relationship and He is actively involved in your life if you will let Him. It's available, it's there, it's right in front of you. And guess what? It's because He loves you that he gives you these things. He gives good gifts to those he loves. So allow the old self to die and let Christ and the fruit be a fulfillment in your life. Those of you that have asked Christ in your life and never realized this fruit of the Spirit is there, You've been, you've been starving yourself and your spirit. Start realizing it's not something you have to pray for. You don't have to pray for love. God gave it to you. You don't have to pray for self-control. God gave it to you. You don't have to pray for kindness and goodness. He gave it to you. He says, exercise it. Eat of that fruit. The more you eat of the fruit, the more of that fruit will be in you. You are a new creation in Christ. You're not the same old person you used to be. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. They've died. They're gone. Behold, all things have become new. And that new creation, the word for that is something that wasn't there before. Like I talked about earlier, when Adam and Eve died, or sinned, they died spiritually. Their spirit died, had been alive. And they walked through this world passing that state of body and soul with the dead spirit on. Because if you read, it says Seth was created in, or born in Adam's image and in Adam's likeness, where it said Adam was made in God's image and God's likeness, but something changed in between and that was sin and the spirit had died. Jesus came that we could have that restoration. He could buy us back and we could have that spirit made alive in us again. And this passage in 2 Corinthians is telling us that we become a new creation. That spirit comes into us and we become something we weren't before. As a matter of fact, in the word, it talks about the Jew and the Gentile. To the Jew first and then the Gentile. And it talks about the Jew and the Gentile, the Jew and the nations all the way through Old Testament and most of the New Testament until it starts talking about the Jew, the Gentile, and the church. When you ask Jesus Christ into your life, you become church. We are the, the church of God. We are the church of Christ. We are the body of Christ. Not a building, not a, uh, a meeting house. Those are buildings, meeting houses, and sanctuaries and temples and sanctified and set apart as that edifice. But the church are the people in the pews, the people that have asked Jesus Christ in their heart and life. And so even in that, Paul talks about there is Jew, Gentile, and the church. The church is made up of those that have accepted Jesus out of the, the Jewish faith or out of the nations. Anyone who accepted Jesus Christ becomes the church. We are a new creation. Christ made you new, alive, and eternal. Now, I've said this before. There are two words people try to use interchangeably. Everlasting and eternal. In a math timeline, you have a, a timeline, a line drawn, and then you'll have an arrow on one side and an arrow on another. That denotes infinity. That's another way of looking at eternity. No beginning and no end. Everlasting, you put a dot in the middle and draw on the line and an arrow on one end going out 
towards infinity in that one direction. That's everlasting life. When you accept Jesus Christ into your life, people say you begin your everlasting life. But God says it's eternal life. He doesn't just start at that point, even though we do. We say from this moment on, because we have spiritual birthdays, before that I was this way, now I'm this way. And we talk about our everlasting life. It will never end. But God looks at it and he sees the eternal because he doesn't forgive just the sins from that moment on. He forgives them all the way back to eternity. And the way I know that is that it says that Jesus Christ was crucified before the foundations of the world. In God's mind, in the Godhead's mind, when they decided to make man and this world, already they had talked about what was going to happen that someone was going to have to come back and redeem them. So you mean God knew man was going to sin? Of course they did, because Jesus had to be crucified in God's mind, just like in Abraham's mind when he was ready to sacrifice his son on that altar, and his knife was raised, and he was all laid out. There was no stopping him, except God stopped him by saying, don't. And he looked, and there was a ram caught in the thicket. He took his son down, and they sacrificed the ram in his place as a sacrifice that was a picture because Abram was told, I know now that you would not withhold your son from me, the son of promise. Before the foundation of the world, Christ was crucified. Already, before they made man, sin was going to be taken care of. Think about this. When God created man and he's made of clay and God knelt down to give the breath of life into that man, the first CPR, so to speak. When he went to go breathe that breath into that man, in his mind, he knew it was going to cost his son his life, that he was going to come here and face the most cruel punishment, the cruel death at the hands of these that he was got about ready to make a living spirit. And he did it anyway. That's how much love he has for you is that he did it anyway because he loves you and he wants you with him forever. He wants you to be that new creation. I implore you, if you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, accept his free gift. He did all the heavy work. He did all the hard work. He did everything necessary for you to be saved. All he says is say yes. When a man asks a woman into his life as his wife, say, will you marry me? Everybody stands waiting. Is it going to be a yes or a no? And when she says yes, immediately they're engaged. And it's the same way here. Jesus is saying, just say yes to my free gift. If you say yes to my free gift, I will take this and I, we will become an entity. Amen. If you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you've, you've walked away or had problems or issues, pray this prayer with me as I pray with anybody new that has not. And if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it's as simple as saying yes to him. Here's what the scripture say, it says in Romans 10, starting verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I'm going to say a prayer. I'm going to stop in between my prayer and I'm going to give you an opportunity to repeat what I say. But don't just repeat it because I said it and think it's magical. It takes you believing in your heart. And if you're ready to ask Jesus Christ into your life as Lord and Savior, say this believing. Make this a, a confession of your conviction, asking Jesus to forgive you. Let us pray. Dear God, I realize that I'm a sinner and I can't make it to you on my own. I understand Jesus came and lived for me, that he died for me, but he didn't stay dead, that you raised him from the dead. I believe that with my whole heart. 
I ask Jesus to forgive me of my sins. And I confess him now as Lord of my life. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer, I want you to get in contact with me. You can do it through uh, comments here. Just say, I prayed that prayer. I'll reach out to you privately. Or in the header of this uh, uh, of this uh, YouTube or, or Facebook, this is going to be posted to YouTube, go ahead and find uh, the email address. Contact us at fgfellowship.org. Send me an email. I'd love to, to converse with you about your new life with Christ. But understand, you now have the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is within you. Eat abundantly of what God's already given you. Amen. Amen. And as we close out today with the Bukit Kohanim, Amen. God bless you. And as you go, if you have prayer requests, things you'd like for us to pray for, contact me. You can send it to prayer at fgfellowship.org. Tell me whether or not you want it shared with others or if you want it as part of the special unspoken requests or just to pray about it without publishing it, whichever. We want to pray for you. We want to lift you up and keep you held up throughout life. If you live in the South Kansas City metro area, we are in uh, Comfort Suites in Grandview, in the boardroom, Sunday mornings, 1030. Come and join us. We'd love to see you. God bless. This is Pastor Jeff Fairley.